Welcome to the Global Business Insights Podcast, brought to you by PSL. I'm your host, Max Kent, and I'll be joined by my co-host, Dr. Charlotte de Brabant. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of the Global Business Insight Podcast. We are our hosts, Charlotte and Max, my partner in crime, and today we have a truly remarkable guest with us. A a man whose intellect very much soars up high as the seagulls in the sky. He's not just a mathematician, but also a captivating educator, an author, TV personality, and a very good friend of mine. Bobby Siegel, it's so nice to have you here with us, and I'm very, very excited for another engaging uh, discussion together. I'm really excited to join your podcast, and it's like a conversation uh, we've had for, for, for eight, how many years? I'm trying to work out when we first met. Nearly 20 years. It's a tw- 20, so it's only a combination of 20 years of discussion between the two of us. <laughs> My gosh, so 20 years, uh, time just flies by. It does, well, like a click. Bobby, then how about we, we get started? Because it's just been 20 years and your your journey has been so remarkable. I think about it. It inspires me and it's my rock that wow. I follow. And, and since the day we met, you've been indirectly a very, very um, big part of my life as a guardian angel and mentor. And there are many people out there that that look at your journey and without you knowing you inspire endless amount of people day by day maybe you can start i mean your your journey goes way back but why don't we just pick a time 20 years ago as you say mm-hmm. and um i remember after university you were also contemplating whether to start at well you did start at lehman mm-hmm. brothers for 48 hours <laughs> um, maybe, maybe you can just explain to us a little bit uh, from just from the from the beginning, um, and what were some pivotal decisions for for you, kind of transferring your career afterwards? Yeah, the, the Lehman uh, period was it, it's really surreal looking back at it because in my time at Royal Hollywood, I knew you. I was very much into my investments. I ran the investment society. I did maths and economics. Um, I did an internship at Lehman Brothers, uh, and I was like, yes, and I, and I got the graduate job uh, in 2007. And at that time, the banking world was still a bit shifty. I think Bear Stearns, you know, uh, RIP to that bank, they disappeared uh, very quickly. Lehman still uh, marched on for like another year and maybe a year and a, and a couple of months after I joined. Um, but it was a bit of a shock because, you know, at the time, uh, I'd worked very hard to get into banking. They're very, you know, to get the trading positions in particular were the most... Uh, uh, demanding roles to get. Um, but I think uh, from that period, it sort of has always given me a sense of being flexible because our parents, our grandparents, they would often join roles for years, for decades, the same job, whereas our generations had to be much more flexible. And for me, I I actually think had Lehman Brothers not collapsed, I think I'd still be there. I'd be head of Europe or something. But because they collapsed, it forced me to really think, oh, my identity investment banker, only like a year and a half, I need to think about what I want to do. So actually, I think that early schism has given me such a flexibility in mind. Wow. I mean, that's incredible listening to this. And obviously, um, I've been really excited to do this podcast with you as well, Bobby. I've been telling everyone, all my friends and family and everyone obviously knows you from the TV. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people excited to hear this one, um, including myself. So um, obviously the background from Charlotte is amazing as well, hearing that as well. And and obviously, yeah, I was thinking when you said Lehman Brothers, obviously that's the name everyone knows for those reasons. So mm. incredible that you came there at that time. But that change actually was the start of the journey in a direction that you don't you know you'd never planned for that you don't know those things change those things happen in life and suddenly you're on a different pathway so I think that happens to us all but amazing how those kind of crossroads happen and you go down a different journey so um, with that in mind 
you were at Cambridge and mm -hmm. you you had, had the academic journey leading up to Lehman Brothers. So um, interesting to walk through some of those experiences and decisions that led to those academic and career pursuits from that kind of crossroads moment, in particular, mm -hmm. the remarkable success with U U University Challenge, which obviously we all watch, which is yeah. fantastic. We were keen to know more about all of that. So please just walk us through some of that. Yeah, thanks, Max. Actually, Charlotte came to watch me in uh, in the in the in the match of the century, Eric Boy, Malcolm versus surprise. Bobby Seagull. So Charlotte exactly. saw witness firsthand probably the most watched match uh, match of Universe Challenge this century. Still to this day, even yesterday, I was on a train uh, uh, to London, and someone who works in the football in the football presenter, he came and said, "Oh, Bobby, how are you? I haven't seen you for seven years." And he said, "Ah." Oh, he said, I still remember the Monk and Seagull match in University Challenge just captured the nation. Charlotte was there in the studio when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for coming, Charlotte. That was, a, that was a while ago. But I think the thing that's really driven me, again, just like since being a child, is my curiosity. Obviously, I'm academic, but I think that stems from being someone that always wants to understand about the world. Again, in my childhood, I was a top student in my borough, London Borough of Newham. I got a scholarship to Eton for A-levels, but all of that was underpinned by my reading. I used to go every single Saturday afternoon with my dad to our local library in East Ham and read all sorts of books on the Aztec civilization, uh, the engineering marvels of the Victorians, uh, or the fiction of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. So actually it's a weekly Saturday reading that actually gave me the knowledge, which I never, to be honest, I was always quite good at quizzes. You know, if there was a team quiz, a pub quiz, a work quiz, I'd always win, but it was just like a fun little hobby. And then when I went on University Challenge, I didn't expect it to completely transform my life because Here's a show which is all about, you know, it's been on since 1962. And the show is all about just showcasing things that you've learned about math, science, history, geography, music, pop culture. And because I've got such a breadth of interest, that really was almost like, yeah, the start of my, my new life, as it were. I love it. And I, yeah, I was there witnessing a lot of it. Yeah, the birth, indirectly, the birth of it. Indirectly influencing. <laughs> yes. Um, but Bobby, after after that, um, you you had another transformation in your life. So transitioning from the financial sector and then becoming mm. an educator is no small feast. And I mm. remember we were both in London having dinner and you were telling me about that transition. Um, maybe you can just elaborate for our listeners what motivated this significant shift and how did your background in accounting then influence mm. your approach to teaching? It was a big shift. I actually wrote a column recently. Uh, I write for the Financial Times and the Independent. And my columns recently was how I went from six figures to 20,000. That was my, my salary drop off. Uh, but in my gap year before I went to university, before my initial time at Oxford, before Royal Holloway, I was at KPMG. So I always knew the accounting finance world drew some currency for me. And in fact, my dad is a chartered accountant, which is why there was a credibility within the household. Um, but after Lehman, I did spend a short time as a trader at Nomura, a Japanese bank, but I did a little shift. I moved to PwC uh, and I qualified as a chartered accountant. And I remember some of my peers at Lehman Brothers in the investment banking, rather than the trading side, they said, oh, Bobby, if you go to PwC, you qualify as a chartered accountant. You know, then you get a proper skill set. You can become a CEO yeah. of Sainsbury's or BP, or you could work in private equity. So it gives you a, a different skill set. Or you could, you know, run a logistics firm because you've got that finance brain. So when I went to PwC, my intention was, ah, let's see how this goes. Maybe become a partner, maybe go into industry. But the thing that changed my perspective was uh, at a place like PwC, when you qualify as a chartered accountant, you get the option of doing a short sabbatical. Normally, uh, Max and Charlotte, people do the sexy one and they go to like Johannesburg or New York or Sydney, whereas I did the one that was teaching and training people in London and that wasn't very popular, so it was easy to get. Uh, but when I did the teaching and training for a few months, I absolutely found I came to life. Again, Charlotte will know from our time at Royal Holloway, I ran an investment course, I ran a debating course. I always loved educating people, um, but I found during this period, I love the combination of being precise because if you're teaching accounting, accounting standards are not woolly. They're not like, oh, maybe this or that. They're, they're quite regimented, but you need to give people a big picture awareness of what's this business trying to do, you know, how they're trying to grow and combining those two things. That almost like that seagull eye view, <laughs> bird's eye view of the, the top level perspective, but then also the granularity of the detail. And that made me think, actually, 
I want to be an educator because I love communicating ideas even more than I did in making just money by itself. <laughs> it's fascinating <laughs> hearing it. It's, it's the combination of precision and um, educating at the same time. Yes. That gives that gives such a picture of how you've come on that route and why it's 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 fallen that way for you. It makes total sense, but that's very, very specific, isn't it? And it has to be for your journey, which I think is fascinating, isn't it? And um, so if we went on to balancing that teaching career with mm -hmm. then the TV side of things as well, I have no idea how you would manage all of those things at the same time. That's pretty diverse. And there's another layer there on top of it. Mm -hmm. So how did you manage all of that together to, to make those two kind of worlds combine, if you like? So after my time, in fact, during my time in Universe Challenge, my objective at the time was purely to try and win the game show, maybe get a bit of kudos within my school because obviously the, the show is such a cachet in the UK. Um, another time I was the head of department for maths at a state school in East London. And I remember as the matches came out, I started trending on Twitter, like hashtag Seagull was number one in the UK radio stations, Capital FM, uh, on various uh, BBC outlets, on various newspapers. They would talk about me as the matches progressed. And then at that stage, I did realize, ah, there's something a bit different. And generally, the, the reason I was plucked out in terms of social media attention was people love my enthusiasm for learning. Like, obviously, I'd get a lot of questions, right? But even if I got things wrong, I'd be like, oh, I didn't realize that. And, and, and I, would, I was just genuinely being myself, having such a fun time. And then because of that, and then obviously, I met my friend Eric Monkman, who was probably, I think, one of the top two or three quizzes ever in the 60-year history of the quiz show. But he was very much like focused and militant and he was more serious than I was. But we were contrasting personalities. We faced each other off with Charlotte Saw in person. Uh, Eric obviously defeated my team. But after that match, we were invited as a pair because we were friends uh, onto various shows, BBC Breakfast, Good Morning Britain, The One Show, even like Gordon Ramsay wanted to meet us, which is so, we actually turned that down because at the time, I think Gordon Ramsay had been a bit, um, bit prickly with some of his uh, guests and my friend Eric Monkman rightly thought he might be a bit uh, unfair towards us, you know, oh, you two nerds coming on my show. But anyway, it was, it was such like an overnight transformation and we had all these opportunities. Um, but I think that, I think the, the key thing is, is that when I had this, opportunity to talk about the, the game show and my experience. Obviously, it's cool. People want to talk about what happened yesterday, but I always used it as a way to talk about why I'm knowledgeable, why what I do, why I choose to, why I left banking to become a teacher. And that actually gave me extra legs because obviously you get people going viral from Love Island or The Traitors in the UK, all these shows, but the reality is they only last for like, you know, maybe a few days, a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year or two. But like, was it like now it's seven years later, I'm still here as a broadcaster and teacher. And I think it's because I always try to bring my enthusiasm to anything I do, especially learning.